For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. A missionary in India, Ruth, had a conversation with a, a, a Hindu social worker. And the Hindu social worker asked Ruth, do you think that most Christians know what they've got? Kind of perplexed by the question, she said, you know, can you explain what you mean? And he said, every religion has a God. Every religion has an altar. Every religion has worshipers. Every religion believes in sacrifice. But only Christians have a savior and only Christians have a congregation. And she walked away with that thinking, do you know what we've got? Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. There was a true story of a woman named Terry. She was 31 years old. She was traveling from here to the States to Australia in 1989. The cargo door kind of somewhat was mis malfunctioned, flew up into the passenger side and ripped off a whole section at 24,000 feet. Nine passengers were automatically sucked out. Terry was sitting next to a devout Christian and he grabbed onto her until she was able to tighten up her seatbelt. But you know, when they landed, she was so grateful for that man and she's, you know, of course he was a Christian and, you know, they were talking, but she said, you know, my life was just like that incident in the plane. The world was just sucking the life out of me. It was just sucking everything out of me that I had. And she said, until this Christian man grabbed me by the arm and grounded me, it made me think about my relationship with our God and each other. See, that's what prayer does, my friends. It grabs us. It grabs us and grounds us. But it also does something else. It brings together people. So when two or three are gathered praying for an intention, they're grabbed, but they're also brought together. In my early days of priesthood, two women that worked as volunteers in Shimokin, and they were best of friends. They really were. They were two soulmates. One was Mary and one was Cheryl. And in, and in Shemokin, they would have volunteers help answering the phone. So one would do like work from, I don't know if it was 8.30 or 9, whatever time we opened, till noon. Then the next one would, would do the afternoon shift. And it was somebody's birthday, we'd always have pizza. And if anybody's from Shemokin, they'd have that James pizza. It's great, my friends. If you ever go to Shemokin, they have that real thin crust. But in any way, we had pizza and we had a nice time. And all of a sudden, Mary says she, she's got to get going. And I said, why? And she said, well, I have this doctor's appointment. And she looks at Cheryl and she said, Cheryl's forced me to go to the doctor's. Now, she's been a nurse her whole life. She was actually a supervisor in nursing. And she said, you know, I just haven't been feeling good for the last month. She said, I've been nausea, I have been eating right. And she said, I just have been feeling really lousy. So she went to the doctors and of course they sent her for more tests and very shortly there after that, she was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer and given weeks to live. From that incident until she was scheduled for surgery was a few weeks. She was the most yellowest person I've ever seen in my life. Like that coat right there. But her eyes were, she was a bright yellow, her eyes were yellow. And it was the saddest thing to see her. And the surgeon actually was honest with Mary and they said, you know, Mary, we're probably we're going to open you up and it's, it's so far advanced, it's, it, the surgery wouldn't even help. And so they, the, the, her two daughters were expecting her to really not even go through the surgery. 
But every time I see this passage, I think of that night, the night before Cheryl and Mary and like 20 others belonged to a Bible study that they met every week. And they would either study the Bible and do these Bible studies, or they would pray the rosary and do these prayers. So this night they decided to pray the rosary, a healing rosary with scriptures. And then they wanted me to anoint her. So after, before each Hail Mary, we would pray a, a scriptural passage on healing. And then at the end of the decade, we would sing a song. The whole thing took probably at least an hour, maybe, but nobody moved. Nobody moved. And there was just something about that evening. And then we, we anointed her and, you know, they put her hands on it. When I was putting her hands on it, it was just a beautiful thing. But she went into surgery the next day and the daughters said that they would call the, the office as soon as they found something. And, soon, and they didn't call. We knew that at least she was going through surgery. I ended up burying Mary 15 years later. She was given weeks to live. You know, my friends, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. When I think of that night and the power that was there with all those firm, devout believers, my friends, it does something. It's interesting, he doesn't use large numbers. He uses two. What's the most common two? Yeah, husband and wife. Exactly, Luke. Husband and wife. When's the last time you prayed with your spouse? Don't raise your hands, please. I wouldn't even want to ask. But how sad. You share everything in your entire life except praying together. And that's one of the things that can bring you the closest together is that. It's an amazing thing, my friends. And to do that, we need to start small. One little prayer, and then it builds on that. But that is the one, it's an amazing thing. And families, we're lucky to even pray grace before meals today, aren't we? There's power in that, my friends. It connects us with our God, and it connects us with each other. It connects us with each other. There was an article I was reading, and it was talking about this, couples, families, congregations, and they were saying everybody fits into two things. Either you're a marble, or you're a grape. What are you, a marble or a grape? You put a bunch of marbles in a bag, two marbles in a bag, three marbles, how many you want in a bag, what happens to the marbles? What do they do? Just rub each other all day long, don't they? Clang, rub, just like we do. Rub each other all day long. You put grapes in a bag, what happens? They mesh. They become one, and they can make something out of it, right? We make wine out of that. You see? Because that's what prayer does. It brings us together. Instead of rubbing each other all the time. It's a passage we need to reflect on, my friends, because there's tremendous power in that. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. God bless you.